I'm Tom, Tom Pitney, and I'm a grateful follower of Christ, and I'm in anger, recovery from internalized anger, depression, fear of rejection, loss of, you know, and loss, perfectionism, and I'm powerless over alcohol, so thanks for coming, guys. Can you uh, join me in a prayer? Lord, be with us tonight. Bring us out of our darkness and into your light. Bless us and be with us. Open our hearts and minds as a share and as we all reflect on you. So when I came into recovery, I was uh, pretty broken. Life as I knew it was over. I'd lost everything that was important to me in my life. Uh, my family was no longer together and I couldn't work and I couldn't even put a coherent thought or sentence together. Uh, there was no doubt at that point that my life was falling apart and uh, so I didn't have any trouble with step one. I was powerless and uh, I was desperate, but God came through in my life, uh, bringing me in, you know, uh, bringing people into my life that actually brought me to this program and uh, were active in their own recoveries and their own uh, uh, Christian walks. So um, they picked me up, literally picked me up, poured me into a chair because I was basically an incoherent pile of goo that couldn't put a coherent sentence together. And I was at my first meeting. So I didn't know what it was about. Um, but at that point then, I, I just feel like that's the point my recovery journey began. But I knew it was the first time I'd held and felt hope in a long time. Um, but I want to turn back the clock and let's talk about just kind of how I got there and how I found my restoration, healing, and peace that God and uh, work in the recovery program brought into my life. And that allows me to be, even be here today to even talk to you about it. So my life began uh, being lured into a home with, I mean, I had very loving parents. Uh, they did whatever the situation was. They just did the best they could with it. And we had good times, but also quite a few struggles. At five, my dad's business failed, and uh, we lost everything. Basically, we had his car. So uh, after showing up at my grandparents' house, we were able to move in there, all five of us in their bedroom, and um, we had some family in town that also had a, uh, my dad's uncle had a, a house on an old, on their old uh, family plumbing yard. So it was basically a house in a junkyard. So uh, we moved in. Once they got it fixed up enough, it was run down, uh, drafty, all that stuff. And, um, you know, had three smashed up cars, collapsed buildings, broken glass toilets, bathtubs, kerosene barrels. Uh, you know, you kind of get the picture. It was Fred Sanford's, uh, Fred Sanford's yard. <laughs> so, uh, but we proceeded on with our lives. And, uh, you know, my teen years, though, um, as we moved into that, my mom got uh, sick, was diagnosed with cancer. And so most of my teen years uh, up, uh, were, were consumed in caring for her as she got sicker and sicker. Uh, even at, you know, as my dad had to work to try to pay all the medical bills and keep us uh, fed and keep everything going, um, a lot of the lion's share of caring for her, uh, you know, fell on me. And it would, it, but it was just a, it was one of the greatest opportunities and blessings I could ever say because her bond was just, just iron, iron strong and thick. And, uh, but, you know, it's not your usual upbringing, you know, your time of uh, teen years, and they weren't too carefree other than I played an awful lot of sports to kind of stay sane. Uh, but, you know, it was literally helping her off the toilet, uh, getting her dressed, uh, and all basic needs that, you know, your usual teenage boy doesn't, uh, you know, have to do for, for their mom. Uh, she was the main, my main connected person in my life, other than my grandfather, who I idolized. And uh, as her disease progressed and so forth, and she got sick and sicker and sicker, uh, she uh, died when I was about 17. And uh, right after that, my grandfather did too. So uh, the two closest people in my life, uh, the two people I idolized the most and was the closest to were gone. Um, there was, I have to say through that whole thing though, you know, a great part was all those, you know, was that bonding time and, and it was priceless. But the other thing that happened through that is my uh, parents accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. So, uh, but what also... They were the, uh, the ones that led me to Jesus. So my folks, through that whole experience in there, uh, found Jesus and, uh, and, and were able to 
uh, bring me to Jesus, which has you know, been the beacon of hope in my whole life. Uh, but just because we had Jesus in our lives, uh, they weren't any easier. Um, as I said, my mother died from her cancer, and at 18, I graduated from high school and prepared to leave for college, except all the resources were gone. And um, so, but the only, uh, so at 18, I was on my own. So, um, and one of the things that we discovered is, if, you know, the whole thing was she was the glue that held the whole family together. And unfortunately, my dad wasn't equipped to be uh, a father. There weren't any resources to help me. So I um, basically worked three jobs at a time, sometimes 90 straight days, multiple jobs. I was in school, held down a major, a minor, uh, actually a double major and a minor, and as I did my professional training. Uh, so, you know, I always say, you know, how big's your dream? So, and I have a big God. So God got me through it. Uh, but later, you know, I, again, I try to, you know, all the negatives, I want to tell you, like, there was a lot of positives as it went too. And sometimes we lose sight of that just in all the negativity and everything we lose. Like, there's been good, really good parts in my life. And my dad remarried a wonderful woman who's because became my second mom. And, uh, you know, Unfortunately, they uh, blended a family together, kind of a Brady Bunch, and uh, the dysfunction began So and, and spiraled and spiraled. Uh, one of the things that uh, unfortunately happened was uh, they were overwhelmed. They were trying to put their lives together, and uh, so they put me into the role of a, uh, you know, a third parent. So unfortunately for me, uh, that put me in the place where I really didn't fit anywhere uh, because, you know, I was responsible for the kids, uh, so they didn't see me as one of them. I wasn't one of the parental units, and uh, I did find out after that, too, that when I went away to, to uh, my training and I was out of the area, there was a culture of the area, a very, very small town, that if you leave, basically, when you come back, you're an outsider. So I didn't belong to there, to them anymore, either. And that really started my, you know, my journey through my life and the spiral into... Uh, struggling with, you know, rejection, uh, perfectionism, uh, and I started internalizing the anger and started stuffing it. And, you know, I just kept stuffing and stuffing the feelings. Uh, they drove down deeper and deeper and deeper into me. And I spent most of my 20s very angry, resentful, building walls, had an attitude of, you know, just being a, you know, a tough, abrasive jerk uh, was normal. And, of course, a recovery I did learned that that was probably a subconscious and really misguided way to protect myself from any more hurts. Uh, but unfortunately, I also carried that into my family. So, but I was intensely lonely, and I remember being on my knees in a church one time asking for somebody to share my life with. <laughs> but I told God, this time I'm going to let you do the picking, because uh, I didn't do such a good job uh, w with the predecessors. So uh, anyway, and he picked... Uh, you know, my bride Betsy, who's been, we've been, we just celebrated not too long ago her 36th wedding anniversary. So, see, she's marched with me through the journey, ups, down, and sideways, and uh, she's here with me tonight, guys. Thanks. Uh, but I do have to talk about another struggle, which is common to some of us here, that in my 20s, uh, I struggle with some excessive drinking, and when I drank, I just couldn't have one or two drinks. I would just go right to excess. Uh, and out of control, I'd get, you know, puking sick, um, you know, to the point of blackout, so forth like that, too. Um, and I come from a family with a, a huge amount of alcoholism on both sides of it. And one day, God actually showed me a vision, played it like a movie, of uh, my family and the destruction and the carnage and the broken families, the lost businesses, all those things like that, and uh, gave me the conviction and strength to just stop right then and there. Uh, you know, I realized it was about the time when the, they were realizing there was a genetic tie, and I realized that I was in the club. And um, so uh, when I stopped, though, um, you know, another one, uh, I didn't do anything beyond that. I just had abstinence. And one of the things that I've discovered over my life is that abstinence does not equal sobriety. Abstinence, abstinence does not equal recovery. And so I stayed me. And I brought that into our home. And I lived with, you know, and became, you know, had the characteristics of a dry drunk. Internalized anger, walls, sarcasm, double standards, blaming fears, 
and uh, you know, not working any recovery, kind of recovery program or getting any kind of counseling uh, was a huge mistake. And uh, you know, as you'll hear a little later, it, it just about cost me my family. Um, so you know, I was moving along in there, and then I get we got you know very deeply involved through our uh, church later and ministry life and so forth. But I, I was still me, and I was in denial about my own internalizing, and I just didn't see it. So. When Betsy and I moved to Florida in 1990, we decided we were going to try and start new, uh, you know, and uh, except we brought ourselves with us. And uh, so there were quite a few times both of us, you know, brought in unresolved issues into the marriage and that added stress. And mine really added a lot of stress. And, uh, you know, the blessing in there also was in 1991, we had our greatest blessing where our daughter Katie was born. And, you know, at that point, we came and started really feeling complete as a family, and God blessed us, you know, with an angel. Um, but, you know, we started realizing our relationship with God wasn't where it needed to be. And so we started looking and digging deeper, and we, and we finally found a real uh, good home church that was, uh, you know, actually we were there, you know, shout out to the Vineyard Church was our church home and our spiritual foundation for 19 years before coming here to Grace Church, uh, which is our next home and our spiritual foundation. Uh, but, you know, what we didn't realize in there was through all our, our things over time, God was still priming us up to get for recovery later on because obviously he knew what the future was going to bring. Um, but even though we had a deep, close relationship with Christ in our lives, we still lived on planet Earth. And life on planet Earth can be, can be tough. And just because you're a believer and just because you have Jesus in your life doesn't absolve you from, you know, doesn't get you off the hook for all the rest of the garbage that life on planet Earth can bring. And uh, we got thrown quite a few curveballs. And, uh, you know, during, you know, the, the time Betsy's health gave way. And about 2001, it really collapsed. And over the next decades, uh, you know, we had years of just, you know, five and six hospitalizations a year, constant medical treatments, life interruptions, all kinds of scary close calls. And, um, you know, so I took on the role and I lived the life of the caregiver spouse. So I worked, dealt with all the, you know, dealt with all those health issues and other things, um, continued as a dad, served in quite a few roles in our church. And uh, we also endured a whole lot of financial hardship uh, because of, of uh, losing another income and also the big medical expenses. And I internalized more and more and more, and I stuffed more and more and more. And I didn't see God's protections at that time. So we've always had, I mean, let me tell you, we, you know, he always came through. We always had enough to pay our bills. We kept our house. We paid, he paid for graduate school for me and even taking care of Katie's educational needs. And he kept coming through with bringing people into our lives that could also support and undergird us. And we could, but we could also support and, and help them too. But, you know, my rejection issues, perfectionism, stuffed and anger, you know, stuff, 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 stuff kept going on. So did my denial. So, you know, through the struggles though, you know, it put a lot of strains on, on our marriage all the things we had to dealt with, had dealt with and so forth, and I started forming walls, I started closing off, I started withdrawing, I started, you know, being afraid of getting hurt by things again, and it really robbed me of the closeness with the people closest to me, and now as I've come to understand that also really, really deeply negatively affected them. You know, I was outwardly, you know, uh, a, a, a great friend and so forth like that, but I wouldn't let anybody in you know, I could be lonely in a room full of people. Uh, but God was working on me, and, uh, you know, we grew, and, and most of the time I didn't know what he was doing uh, to keep us growing, and most of the time we don't know. And, you know, he was there the whole time, and that's a big part of my story. In 2012, I wasn't working any kind of a recovery program. I'd become too busy with what I believed, what God was calling me to do in ministry, helping others, and I didn't realize that my own house behind me was burning down. Um, as I spent more and more time away from home doing all those, you know, good works and everything else, I couldn't see that, that my wife and daughter were struggling deeply. Um, and this began about the 
two toughest years of my life, and probably even worse for them. Uh, our beautiful daughter had been struggling with an eating disorder. Uh, Betsy's health had uh, begun to finally improve uh, with a whole lot of prayer and some new treatment, but a lot of my past difficulties connecting and closeness with them had really hurt my marriage and my relationship with, um, with my daughter and with others. So we were struggling quite a bit during that time period. And, uh, you know, we were always unified in the care of our daughter, um, but not much else. And uh, what I, I just, just so many things that I just didn't see. I didn't see, uh, I didn't see that. I was in denial for that. And I also didn't see the looming as she improved. Uh, it also created a chemical imbalance uh, that arose out of the success of the treatment. So we had the blessings of that, but unfortunately created some more uh, some more issues. Um, I will say during my life, the worst day of my life was when we dropped uh, our daughter off at a residential treatment center on the East Coast because uh, eating disorder had taken over. Our baby was uh, starving herself to death and I couldn't do anything to stop it. Um, we prayed and prayed, but it just, you know, we, we didn't realize in our agony, though, through the whole thing um, that each of us were also suffering. Uh, we prayed constantly, uh, and it's always, isn't it? I always put a note to myself in here because, uh, you know, it's always, we always, you know, pray when uh, we're in a crisis, but how about when we're not? And, uh, you know, so it was possible, was, we, we couldn't see the blessings in all these things that were going on and the awful things that were going and fighting for our daughter's life. Um, but God was there anyway. He did not leave us. So over time, uh, just to fast forward that part, because uh, I'm going to move to some other parts of my life, but over time, uh, healing did come to Kate, and uh, it's taken years and not days, but she's in full recovery, and uh, she's actually an ICU nurse over at Gulf Coast uh, Hospital, and, and uh, you know, she's there and just, uh, yeah, yeah, she's keeping people alive at night. Well, right now while we're talking, she's keeping people alive and uh, so there is hope out there when you have, you know, when life throws you that stuff and everything. Don't give up the hope, uh, you know. But we came to celebrate recovery at that time when it was still celebrate recovery. And uh, during through those illnesses, and it was, you know, we, we came, you know, we didn't need it or I didn't need it. You know, we came, came I came to help her, you know. And that's not realizing that, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was a bigger mess. So my denial, resentments, anger, and all that were still going on. Um, and they didn't show on the outside, but boy, were they ugly and they were there. Um, but even during that, I can see now looking back that the groundwork was starting to be laid for the recovery later when it all collapsed. Um, we got her home, but a few weeks later after that, uh, I got uh, an emergency call from our doctor's office. The police and EMS were on the way to her house. Uh, one of the third, worst things I've ever heard in my life was an officer telling me, don't go there. Um, he, he, he said, you shouldn't come home. Um, my baby, had t my, you know, she'd taken a, a large number of pills, uh, was being transported to ER, and I never saw that she was hurting so bad uh, because I was so wrapped up in my own, uh, you know, just my own denial and my own... Uh, you know, just in, internalizing inside. Um, the chemical had balanced and taken over. Um, she made some bad decisions, but, um, you know, and, and um, the troubles had pushed her over the edge, and our, our, our difficulties had pushed her over the edge. So, um, you know, but what followed next was a Baker Act commitment, prolonged inpatient stay in a... Uh, a marriage separation, and then ultimately a miraculous healing, and that—that's—that's um, that's where I came to recovery. Um, after that, during the separation, uh, you know, God had come to us physically in a in a uh, in a Holy Spirit appearance in a counseling session. Uh, watched the fog roll right across the floor and hit us, and the scales came off both our eyes, and each of us. Uh, just came clean, or I came clean on my side, and he showed me me. That was where God gave me the visual picture of my heart, and it was hard. It was hard. It was stone. Um, it was hard-hearted, 
And, um, but as God does, it wasn't a blaming, it wasn't a punitive, it was showed it to me so he could work with me to, to heal it, make it better and soften it. So as those scales came off, uh, we, I was able to forgive, we were able to forgive, and we started coming to uh, still celebrate recovery at that point before choose recovery. Uh, but we came for, you know, I came for me and she came for her. We weren't coming to fix each other. And that's been the rock, that's been the rock solid part of our recovery. We work, we've always worked our recovery programs, but we've, uh, we've worked them at the same time, but we worked them separately. And yet it's brought the fruit into the life because that way then we could work on us. Uh, and we could work on repairing the family. Um, but I, right away I got a sponsor. I started working the steps. Um, and then pretty soon after that, uh, you know, um, I just started drilling deep. And it was tough, but the healing came. And I was, you know, as I found recovery, I was willing to move and ad admit my, you know, addictions to work and performance. I was able to see my afflictions, that I had issues with abandonment, rejection, anger, fear, depression, pride, unforgiveness, resentment, you know. The list goes on. And I admitted that I had compulsive behaviors like overworking, even the good things in the kingdom and the church work. I had no trouble admitting my powerlessness and that I needed Jesus as my higher power. And I finally uh, gave in. And I gave in and gave my will to God as in step three. Uh, this is where I surrendered to the changes that God wanted to make into me. I ran at step four. Uh, I, w I didn't want to be carrying those dead bodies anymore. Step five, my, you know, we just drilled deep and the healing began. Um, really, step four and five are my favorite step to, steps to this day. Um, you know, it was just, uh, you know, I've been a it's enabled me to work on my character flaws. It's enabled me to make my amends. It's enabled me to work on my conscious contact with God. You know, do a daily inventory and, and take the message of strength and hope to others. And through that, I've been able to sponsor multiple men, served in a whole lot of roles, and, and celebrate and choose recovery. And uh, things like Justin's Place, taking the message in there, Lee County Jail in there, uh, you know, and then co-facilitating for years the men's codependency and anger group uh, where we can work on, uh, you know, those same issues with other men. And we've all dealt with all those. And, um, you know, as I say in there, we're not about anger and, and we're not, there's no anger management, but it's, it's anger recovery. And, uh, you know, we don't manage anything. And, uh, you know, but we found recovery by getting honest. You know, you've got you to have that honest search. So as we work in our family together, um, we've had restoration. The family, I've had restoration. You know, uh, our daughter's in recovery, as I said. She's, you know, November 12, 2013, married the man that we've been praying for, the godly man. Uh, you know, that would be her husband. And uh, my dad and I have even, you know, healed our relationship. You know, I wouldn't have this, relation, this life that I have today if it weren't for my sponsor, my accountability team, Jesus, Choose Recovery, Celebrate Recovery, our churches. You know, it's, it's a team. And uh, I finally moved along with the steps in a real recovery. One thing I did find was lone wolves don't make it in recovery. I had to get in there with everybody else. And uh, if you don't have a sponsor, you're really missing out on the blessing, not just from them, but you're also missing out on giving them the blessing of working with you in your recovery. And that's not fair. So um, continue to work constantly in my own program. Now that I'm working through the steps, I'm happier. I've lived more in the last 12 or 13 years than I did the whole 50 before. And uh, more than ever, with the help of the people in my life that God has brought to me through recovery. Um, I can stand on my scripture, on my life scripture, which is Joel 2.25, I'll restore the years the locusts have eaten, and boy has he. So now I can see where I can take my own experience, strength, and hope and bring that to others. So Jesus was there the whole time through there. He knows what's coming tomorrow, uh, but through Jesus and the steps, 
God placed in my path with me. I'm not by myself anymore. I'm not alone. I'm not a lone wolf. And through recovery, I've learned to let others in. And the walls are coming down. And I'm a work in progress. But may God bless all of you and protect you in your recovery. My name is Tom, and I'm a grateful Christian in recovery from anger, depression. And I struggle with fears and worry. Thanks for letting me share my story.